Welcome everybody. If you got here a little late, my name is Pastor Greg and we're so excited to have you here today at the place. This is week one of a brand new series that we're doing. You see the brand new series back here. We're doing your church, my church, our church. And it's sort of good because it really breaks down the transition that maybe a lot of us have gone through. And maybe it's a place that we're even at today. You know, I think whenever we, we look at a church and come into a church, there's a moment when that church, really, you're looking at it through the eyes of someone else and you're saying, hey, that's, that's your church. I'm going to go to your church. I'm going to check out your church. And then hopefully there's a season or a time of transition where that changes from being your church to being my church. In other words, this is the place that I'm going. This ain't your church anymore. It's my church, right? Some of you guys, hopefully, there a little attitude today, you know, my church. Don't you talk about my church. Uh, but the moment that we reach to the next phase is where we can really have an incredible amount of power in the community. And I think it's a place that really God wants us to be. And that's where we reach the place where we move from my church to our church. And we realize that we as a community are in along this journey together and that God has brought all of us together to be part of what he wants to do in this community. So that's really the place where we're going to be moving. And you see, over the next five, six weeks, we're going to be unpacking. You see these different signs back here. These signs are really the vision and direction that the church is going to be moving to because we wanted to break things down and make things very simple for us to do what God is calling us to do in our community. So you're going to be seeing and understanding what all of these mean in the next few weeks, but really today, today is going to be about laying the foundation. Today is going to be our foundation day, really laying that foundation down. But before I get started, you know, I came across a story and it actually had happened on a Sunday morning, just, just, like, just like today. And it was on a Sunday morning where uh, William, his, his mother came into her son's room and said, William, it's Sunday, time to get up, time to get up and go to church. Get up. Well, he was tucked up underneath the, the, the covers really good. And from underneath the covers, you could hear a mumble. And it said, I don't want to go, right? Mom said, well, what do you mean? She said, that's silly. Now get up, get dressed, and go to church. He shot back, no. I'll give you two reasons. I don't like them, and they don't like me. Well, nonsense, she told him. I'll give you two reasons to go. First, you're 42 years old. <laughs> and second, you are the pastor. <laughs> oh, I'll snap. Well... Hopefully no one here had that kind of day. I know I didn't, but we are here together. And, and let me tell you, walking into this series, I'm so excited because just recently our church really was at a, a, a turn. We were at, at a place where we really had to look to the future and make a decision about the direction that we were going to go as a church body. And I believe God, through his spirit, has spoke very clearly that discipleship really is going to be at the core and the foundation of this church. And that we believe in a statement that you're going to hear more and more in the, in the months to come. And that's a simple statement that says, each one, make one. Meaning that we first are called to be a disciple. And secondly, we are called to make disciples. That's at the core of what we're called to do. But before we get to that, this week we're going to be laying the foundation. So grab your Bible. And uh, if you need a Bible, hopefully there's one underneath your seat. And uh, we're going to open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And I'm so excited uh, to go to Matthew 28 because it is a portion of Scripture that we started talking about last uh, series. And I love how God allows us to take Scripture sometimes and weave them in as we look at different sermon series. And this was definitely one of them. And it may be a portion of Scripture that you've uh, read before or maybe you've heard before in the past. It's, we're going to be looking at verses 18, 19, and 20. So Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
Okay? Now, this is known by some to be the Great Commission. This is the time right before Jesus ascends into heaven before his disciples. He calls his disciples and he gives them the message. And it's really a message that we're going to be building on this idea of therefore go and make disciples. But see, before we get to that part, we got to back up and we got to see what was said first. And what was said first was this statement. Jesus came to them and said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Okay. So Jesus comes and he starts with that declaration and saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, when we look at this subject of talking about authority, there's another word that is synonymous, is the same as, as authority, especially when we look at it through scripture. And that word is uh, simply this. That word is dominion. Dominion. So Jesus said, all dominion, all authority has been given to me. Now, this is a word that we find all the way through the Bible. In fact, go ahead and flip your Bible back to the very first book in your Bible, the book of Genesis. And we're going to start at Genesis 1, uh, and we're going to look right at chapter 1, and we're going to pull out a scripture that talks about this subject here of dominion. Genesis 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26 reads like this. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And so we see here that even from the very beginning that God said to man, let them have dominion. All right. So let me hear you say dominion. All right. Let them have dominion. Okay. What does that mean? Dominion. Well, in the Hebrew, dominion simply meant to rule to dominate or to have dominion. So we find in the very beginning, man was given dominion by God. Now let's go to the next chapter, chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. Look at two verses, verses 16 and 17. Carry that thought through. It says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but... You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, this is interesting because what God is doing in the heart of man is he's saying dominion, but I want, I want you to see what he's doing. He's saying that you need dominion within parameters, okay? In other words, here, you can come here, you can do... I know you guys are thinking defense, right? You guys are thinking football. Uh, no, no, we're using it for a different purpose today, all right? So we have dominion within parameters. He says you can come, you can eat of any fruit in here. You can do this. You have dominion over this, but there's a tree that we don't want. In other words, there's parameters that we expect you to live by. There's dominion, but the dominion is within parameters. And Adam and Eve begin uh, walking in this dominion within parameters. And the Bible describes how their life was like. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 reads like this. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. See, there's an incredible uh, freedom when we operate dominion within parameters. They had a freedom in their relationship, a freedom in their life. They had a skip in their step and a joy in their hearts when they were operating with dominion within parameters. But you know the story as well as I. Someone slithers right into the middle of their story, and that's the enemy. That's Satan himself. He slithers in and he goes right over to Eve, right? And he begins communicating with Eve. And it's really interesting what he says to Eve. And we see it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. So he slithers on in, right? And then we hear his voice in the second part of the first verse in Genesis chapter 3. And here's what he says. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, one thing I need you to see right here is when the enemy came in and started messing with Eve, that e the enemy is not questioning the existence of God, right? Not coming in, oh, is there really a God? Do you think God really exists? No. The enemy knows God exists, right? Adam and Eve walk with God. And so he's not questioning God. What's he questioning? He's questioning the parameters around the dominion. 
Did God really say that you can eat from these trees here in the garden? Did God really say that? And, and, and when the enemy is bringing this question and causes Eve to begin to question the parameters that they're in, her dominion is about to be affected. Because you know as well as me, she ends up falling for that temptation. She ends up eating of that fruit, giving that fruit to her husband, who takes and eats of the fruit also, and the Bible tells us in verse 7, describes what happens in the midst of that moment. It says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Remember, they were naked, they were amongst each other, and they felt no shame. Remember that? Shame. They didn't have any shame. As they had dominion within parameters, they had no shame. Once these parameters were taken out, we find shame entering into their life. Everything that they knew began to change because they were operating dominion outside of the parameters that God had set up for them. And it's really interesting for us because when they took the parameters out and they said, well, we're just going to do whatever we want to do, right? What ended up happening with this dominion is this dominion ended up going somewhere else. They handed over dominion to sin. Sin then in the midst of that moment when once they had dominion, now that dominion was handed over to sin and sin was able to have control in that dominion realm. And we see it because God describes to Adam what his life is going to be like now. When he was operating within the parameters, he felt no shame. They had everything that they needed, everything that they possibly wanted. They walked with God each and every single day. And then he describes, God does, what life is going to be like now, starting in verse 17 of chapter 3. Here's what we read. To Adam he said, God said, because you listened to your wife, And you ate fruit from the tree from which I commanded you. Since you operated outside, you see that, of the parameters that I have set up for you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. He goes on to say, it's going to produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will, you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And in that moment, what we find is we find sin coming in and creeping in. As you continue to read the story, the story quickly begins to change. When it goes from once where they're taken care of and there's total peace and there's no shame, everything begins to change as sin comes in and begins to consume everything. Sin takes control over everything. Sin takes authority over the earth. Quickly, we see jealousy and we see murder. And we see fighting. And it all begins and everything begins to unravel as the fruit of sin pours out its consequences over all of the earth. And this goes on for generations. I mean, this is the the place of earth. Dominion had been given over to sin. And it is into this sin-sick world that we find someone entering into the scene. You know his name as well as mine. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ enters into into this place and you know his story he goes around and he teaches and miracles happen and healings happen and all these great things happen but he came with a purpose and his purpose was to lay down his life on a cross at calvary for you and i his purpose was actually to become a passover lamb now some of us may not know what that means i'm going to try to break it down for you real simply the uh israelites were slaves in egypt god through moses goes to pharaoh says let my people go you've probably heard this and he goes back all right well if you don't do this this is going to happen and bad things begin to happen to the egyptian people because they won't let the israelites go finally the very last thing that has to happen, God comes to the Jewish people and says, here's what I want you to do. Put blood over your door. You remember that story, right? The angel of death is going to come in and he's going to take the firstborn of every family unless you have the blood of the lamb over your door. Those are the houses he's going to pass over. 
So in the midst of that moment, and we remember that there was a cry like never before as the angel of death came in and touched every home as the firstborn of every house died, except those that had the blood of the lamb on their doors. Now we understand that because they, the angel of death passed over the homes that had the blood of the lamb. Now every year, generation after generation, once a year they would celebrate this thing called Passover, and they would sacrifice a lamb that became the Passover lamb. Now, that lamb had to be a perfect lamb. No blemish could be in that lamb. It had to be, and it would cover over the people. It would cover over their sin until that next year when another perfect lamb would be chosen. Well, Jesus, in our lives, is that perfect Passover lamb. In fact, it's really interesting when we look at the story of Jesus and we look at the story of the Passover lamb because there's a lot of things that coincide that when we read the story of Jesus, we might overlook, but definitely the Jewish people who celebrated Passover every year, they wouldn't overlook it. Let me give you one example. For example, the Passover lamb was led into the city five days before Passover. You remember that time when Jesus was led into the city? Wow, five days before Passover. Do you know when the lamb came into the city, the lamb was inspected for four days to make sure that there was no blemish in that lamb. Do you know Jesus, when he's questioned and questioned and questioned, he's being inspected for four days. Did you know that the priest would finally, at the end, make this statement? He would make this statement about the Passover lamb. He would say, I find no fault in him after four days of inspection. Does that sound familiar? If you've read the story of Jesus, it does, because those are the exact same words that Pontius Pilate, the leader of Judea, said about Jesus at the end of the time. He says, I've, I've, I find no fault in him. Did you know that the Passover lamb, when they, they would uh, sacrifice thousands and thousands of thousands of livestock until finally the Passover lamb would be sacrificed. In that moment, the high priest who was sacrificing that lamb, he would make a simple statement. His statement to everybody would be this. It is finished. The same words that Jesus said right before he gave up the ghost and died for you and I. Did you know that that Passover lamb, after thousands of lambs had been sacrificed, would normally happen around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the exact time that Jesus died. Do you see some coincidences here? No. I think God knew all along that Jesus was our Passover lamb. You see, Jesus was the one who came and laid down our lives for us. You know, he was the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Isaiah 53, verse 5, that said, but he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, for my transgressions, for your, trans, for your kids' transgressions. That's what he was pierced for. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. See, that's what happened in the midst of that moment when Jesus died. That's why his death is so important and so vital for each and every single one of us. But there's a verse that a lot of times we look over. And it has to do with what happened when Jesus died. And the Bible is very clear about what happened inside the temple when Jesus laid down his life. You see, there was a curtain inside of the temple. In fact, it was stories high. It was, it was very, very high. It was three inches thick. That's how thick it was. And it separated the people from, let's say, the holy of holies. Or let's say it separated the people from God. Okay? There was a curtain that separated them. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 15, verse 38, that when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. This thing that separated man from God was destroyed in the midst of Jesus laying down his life. When he breathed his last breath, this is what happened. What does that mean? Well, that's a picture of authority. That's a picture for you and I of dominion. Saying that separation that had stopped you from accessing to God is no longer there. And Jesus, in the midst of that moment, spoke to sin. Dealt with this area right here. You see, sin had authority for generations until the price was paid. You see, sin was in control until the price was paid. But in that moment, everything changed. See, in that moment when Jesus laid down his life, dominion, 
right, passes over here. Dominion is rescued from sin because the price was paid on a cross at Calvary. So when Jesus returns to his disciples before he ascends and he makes this message to them, which we often look over, but they didn't look over it when they heard it. And that message was this. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What he's saying, all dominion is mine. I paid the price for it. Sin, right, no longer has control of this. I have it, I have rescued, redeemed, saved you from this. So th- does that make sense? Make sure I didn't lose you. Okay, so here we are. So why in our lives sometimes do we feel like we're in a tug of war? I don't know if you ever feel that way. I do. This tug of war, you know, uh, like sin and God, I want to serve God, but I feel like I'm over here and, I, you know, am I, am I really free? I'm going back and forth. I mean, why do we feel like we're in that place sometimes? I mean, if dominion is here, well, why, why do we find ourselves being pulled back and forth? You see, so many of us, we want to walk around with a full understanding of who has control in this world. I got to tell you, Jesus has authority, dominion over everything. He has dominion and authority over your sickness. He has dominion and authority over your family. He has dominion and authority over that thing that keeps you up at night. You know what it is. He has dominion and authority over that thing. It's over here, not over there. But see, each and every single person has to come to the place where you decide who you want to allow to have authority in your life. In other words, here you are with this. You make the choice in your life who's going to hold the dominion. You make that choice. I can't make that choice for you. Your parents can't make that choice. No one else can make that choice. You have to make that choice. Do you know if you're sitting here, sin can still rule your life? If we make that decision, sin can still rule your life if you let it however when we commit our lives to christ we transfer dominion from that place of sin to that place of the cross we transfer dominion over to god and we transfer that dominion when we make a decision in our lives that we are going to follow after christ see that's that's what it means i'm going to make a decision to follow after you dominion transfers from that place over to this place it happens in this thing called discipleship check out what paul said to the church in rome if, you, if you've got your bibles you can look at romans chapter 6 verse 17 and 18 i think it makes this point really really clear for us paul said this he said but thanks be to god that though you used to be slaves to sin you see that though dominion in your life used to be in this place of sin used to be a slave to sin Okay, all of us. And you know, the Bible says there's not one person that hasn't been here in the trash. Like we've all been there. So it's okay. It's we're in this thing together. We've all been in this place. Some of us found out sooner than others not to be in this place. Others found out later. Some of us are about to find out today. Hallelujah. And uh, but but we are all sort of in this place at one time in our lives. The next part of that, even though you used to be slaves to sin, the Bible says, that you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has claimed your allegiance. That's discipleship, okay? That's this area here where we're discipled. We have come to obey that teaching, that thing that we're learning. We're in this process of learning and growing and discipleship. And the Bible tells us through this discipleship, we reach a place where we have been set free. Set free from sin. Watch it. Set free from sin and become a slave to righteousness. A slave to right living. A slave to Jesus. That we are sold out following after him. See, that's what it's about. And that, my friends, is how we go about doing what God has called us to do, to go and make disciples. See, he's told all of us to go and make disciples, but sometimes we have a hard time making a disciple when we're not a disciple ourselves. Or we have a hard time making a disciple when we've never been discipled. No one ever discipled me. How am I supposed to disciple someone else? Some of you may be thinking that right now. 
See, before we can ever strive to make a disciple, we have to understand three things, and that's why this is the foundational message of this series. The first thing you have to know, if you ever want to make a disciple, the first thing you have to know is this, that you have been set free by the blood of Jesus. That you have not been set free because you're smart enough, you're good enough, that you've done enough, or because you're so dang good looking. You know you are, all right? But that is not what has set you free. The blood of Jesus, what happened on a cross in Calvary, is the only thing that has the power to set you free. That is it, okay? Amen? Amen. All right. Number two, that when you transfer over to this place, that you are a man or a woman under authority. That you are under the authority of the cross or the authority of Jesus. All authority has been given to him. Through that, we walk in the authority that we have in this earth. Okay? Makes sense. Yes. All right. So we've been set free by the blood of Jesus. We are under his authority. And here's the last one. You got to get this. This is the one that most people here are going to have a hard time with. That you have an incredible power in his authority. See, oftentimes we don't mind understanding, God, you got authority. Jesus, you can do it, but not me. I ain't smart enough. I ain't good enough. I don't know what to do. You're right. You're none of those things. But through him, you can do all things. You see that? And when we begin to see ourselves that way, not through our own eyes, but begin to see ourselves through the eyes of the cross, everything changes. There's an incredible power that comes with that. You know, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, talks about that. It says this, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You've got to see. You receive power with a purpose. Did you guys see that? You receive power, why? To be a witness. You don't, receive, be, po- you don't receive the power so that you can look good to everybody else, so that you can look like you're the smartest person around, so that you can know more Bible verses than anyone. That's not why you get the power. You get the power so that you can be a witness. You get the power so you can make disciples. But he freely gives that power to each and every single one of us. You know, it reminds me of, if any of you guys ever had the vacuum salesman come over to your house? Yeah, if you do that, I'm, I'll pray for you. Uh, I've had that, you know. I mean, I heard this story about this one guy who goes over, and one of the things that they do is they dump all kinds of garbage on your carpet, right? They got all kinds of dust, and this one guy, he goes over to this house, and he has this huge, he dumps this pile of dust, like, on the carpet, and he's talking about how good his vacuum is. My vacuum is so good. This vacuum will take care of all this dust, and there's all this stuff in this big pile, and all this nasty, nastiness all on our carpet, and he's like, my, my vacuum can do that. He says, and if my vacuum can't do that, I will sit down with a spoon, and I will eat that dirt, Right? And she said, well, you better go get that spoon because we don't have electricity. <laughs> you know, so, some Christians are like that, right? <laughs> we ain't got electricity. That electricity is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit working in your life, that's that power. When you're going through your life and you just get this unction in your heart, man, I better talk to that person. Man, I better say something to that person. That's the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. When you get this thing inside your heart, man, I got to pray for this person. I, I'm hearing it all over. People are calling me up since we've been talking about discipleship all the time. All the time. I got a phone call this week. This person said, man, I was, I was driving to work and praying for my family just like I always do. And I, there was an unction in my heart to call my ex, I don't know, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, something like that, my, my ex, right? And I'm like, hey, do you normally talk to him? He said, no, I haven't talked to this individual in a long, long time. He said, did you do it? He said, yeah. I was like, was it a good conversation? Absolutely. That was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit saying, call, 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 you know? And he picks up the phone. and does. I had someone else that I'm, rec- I'm discipling this one individual, and I taught him the Roman road. And he's excited, man. He's like, man, I can't wait to teach someone the Roman road. He called me up last night. He's like, man, I got to tell you, my coworker, I got him fired up for Jesus. Tomorrow, I'm going over the Roman road with him. I'm like, praise the Lord, man. This guy's fired up, but he's listening and he's following the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And watch this. God's using him in a great way. Does he know all the answers? No. But you know what he has a heart for? He's a heart after God. And the Holy Spirit is empowering him and using him. The Holy Spirit wants to do that in your life, too. There have to be a willing heart, a willingness to open up and say, God, will you use me? Will you use me in my family? Will you use me in my workplace? Will you use me with my neighbors, even the annoying one who won't turn the radio down? Amen. All right? You know who they are. The one you keep calling the cops on. That's the one I'm talking about. All right? 
Holy Spirit, use me, right? Use me to impact that person. He wants to use you in your life. There's an incredible power that needs to come in your life. But there's purpose behind power. And the purpose behind the power that God wants to pour into your life is to make disciples, is to pour out your life into the life of someone else. Each one, make one. In order to make a disciple, we got to be a disciple. And to be a disciple, we need to make a disciple. And when we do that, we see revival begin. And the beautiful thing, revival starts in our hearts, and it starts in the hearts of one other person, and the one other person, and that's that kind of grassroots thing, man, that wildfire effect that has the ability to change our entire community and ultimately to change the world. Amen? Now, there's some here that say, I don't have that power. There's some here that would say, you know what? When I look at my life, I know who has dominion. I know because I'm struggling, I'm angry, and I'm upset, and I'm frustrated, and I try to do this, and I try to do that, and I try to break free, but I'm not breaking free. God brought you here today. He brought you here with a purpose. He brought you here to show you this right here, that he paid the price to set you free. You're trying to do it on your own. You're reading every self-help book and you're doing this and you're doing that and you're not breaking free. You're, you can't figure out how to do it because you in and of yourself can't do it. He did it. You're he did what you're trying to do. And Jesus would say, all you have to do is transfer your trust, right? Transfer your trust, put it in me. Commit your life, follow after me. Give me dominion over your life and watch what happens. So my question to you is simple. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to open up your heart and your life and say, you know what, I'm giving dominion over to you today, God. I'm transferring over. And I'm going to tell you, in the midst of this moment, you have the ability to leave the trash can to go to the cross. And when you do that, great things will happen. Can I pray for you? Bow your heads with me. As I was saying that, some of you in your heart, you, you know you're in the trash can right now. You know you're not set free. You know you're struggling. You know you desperately need God to do something in your life. God brought you here today, and you don't know all the answers. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to know all the answers. He knows all the answers, and he's already done it for you. And if you're here today and say, you know what? That's what I want in my life. I want to transfer to the cross. I want to commit my life to follow after Jesus. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of doing this thing all in and of myself. I want God to work in me and through me. And if you're here today and you say, man, that's what I want in my life, I want to say a prayer with you. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to embarrass you. In fact, you stay sitting right where you are. Here's all I'm going to ask you to do. Just lift up your hand. Just say, you know what? That's what I want in my life. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Hands all over this place. Who else says, yes, that's what I want. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. God's touching hearts and touching lives today. He's saying today is the day we're transferring over. Today is the day we're getting out of the trash can. Today is the day we're committing everything over to Jesus. Hands all over this place said today's that day. And listen, maybe you're here and you're already following after Jesus. I want you to join those that are going to say this prayer for the first time. I want you to pray this prayer with them. Maybe reaffirm in your heart and your life who you're following. If you lifted up your hand, I want you to repeat after me. If you're here and you're already following Jesus, join those that are praying this prayer for the first time. Say, Jesus... I give it all over to you. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I believe that you lived, that you died, that you rose again to set me free. And I commit today to follow you. Forgive me, Lord, for what I've done, for what I haven't done. Give me strength follow you today and every day.